Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 73. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, salute to you. Hey, Johnny boy. How's it going? <laughs> You're down the Cape, enjoying the last days of summer. Um, in the office, uh, getting ready for the, another surge of events. Um, Cube's had a good good run coming up big time. You just got Oracle Cloud World. This week, you had the Apple event. OpenAI's got some new news. Oracle and Amazon have a relationship. We're going to dig into that. Uh, OpenAI's got a uh, new model, good reviews on that, and funding looming on the horizon, raising billions of dollars, and uh, you know more controversy around Intel. I just read your special breaking analysis on LinkedIn that you posted. I want to get into that. Um, I'll be at the Google Cloud Security event, Mandiant. Is their MY, as they call it, Mandiant, it's a company that does threat intelligence, Google bought. Kevin Mandy is going to be his last event. Uh, he's going to go to chairman role. And, uh, you know, the company's just been hugely successful. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of great stuff going on. Again, you just posted this special breaking analysis. I love the special breaking analysis. It's the uh, two this week, one coming on tomorrow morning that you filmed right. yesterday. Uh, one on uh, Oracle, and then the one I had. A, I had the. I don't know if you want to talk about it now, but you tell me. Well, well let's get to the, let's get to, um, Oracle later. Let's get into this um, root cause of Intel's troubles because there was a post, a series of posts around Intel. Um, you called out um, Patrick Moorhead's post, the uh, semiconductor analyst over at More Insights. He's the founder of. Uh, also, he's the, he is in business with Futurum Group for six five um as well um according to you dave you got it all wrong well i mean patrick i have a lot of respect for him i think he's a good analyst um but he put out a post on forbes and the title of it caught my attention it said splitting intel's fab business from its design business now doesn't make sense and i was like well i disagree but so i read the post and his fundamental premise is that the foundry business is according to you know any estimate, has negative value. So his point is that's, that splitting it out now wouldn't do Intel any good because of, of that valuation. And his feeling is that they'd be better off getting its foundry business act together and its chip design business act together uh, before they make any such move. Presumably, he's thinking so that they could monetize it. And then he talked about 18A and and the positive parts of 18, the 18A process and how 14A is is super important. I've said, as you know, many times that 14A is really the the one that matters because that's the one that that is potentially leapfrogs from a process standpoint, at least in in my opinion. Uh, TSMC again, this is all theory. 14A does uh, backside power, gate all around. Uh, NAEUV, which is very advanced. Uh, I think Intel was the first to get that uh, that system from ASML. Uh, but I've also said that it ain't going to happen um, for a variety of reasons. And so I, I talked to to David Floyer, who's my colleague in all of this stuff, and so sort of the consigliere, and 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 he's able to just really dig in and draw upon his history from his IBM days and watching the semiconductor business. And we decided that. Uh, it made sense to actually write something. I didn't specifically call out Pat in the post, but I did link to to his post. Um, and and basically, as John, as you know, we sounded the the alarm on Intel over a decade ago. And you know, we even as recently as five years ago said Intel should split its manufacturing and, and design business and others on Wall Street, the B of A analyst was sort of on board with that and, and a number of others. And But instead of doing that, Pat decided to double down on the integrated manufacturing strategy, you know, IDM, you know, 2.0. Um, even recently, we said that he was going to need a miracle to achieve the objectives of surpassing Samsung by the end of the decade. So we felt like it was important to address the root cause of Intel's trouble. And I'll give you the, you know, the too long don't read that we posted was in 2012, PC volumes peaked. And that's when Intel's manufacturing cost advantages began to wane because volume, volume, volume is everything. And we we reinvoked and the same law that we've been talking about for a long, long time, which is rights law. 
And, you know, rights law basically says that your cost of manufacturing, you know, declines for each subsequent uh, node, if I apply it to semiconductors, as a function of volume. So your manufacturing volumes, cumulative volumes double and your and your cost for the for the next generation go down. And the problem that Intel has is that because of smartphones and because of ARM, TSMC has a massive volume advantage. So we we laid that out again and then you know explain that this law is immutable, um, at least through one nanometer. So Floyer did his magic. He came up with uh, estimates of the wafer volumes that Intel is seeing versus TSMC from 2014 to 2024. Um, and it's just dramatic difference and how that affects the cost per wafer. So the estimate now is that in 2024, the additional cost percentage per wafer for Intel relative to TSMC calculated using Wright's law and some assumptions around that is 35%. So the other compounding effect, John, is that it's now taking Intel an additional 375 days by our estimates to build and qualify a new foundry compared with uh, TSMC. So that all adds up to you know basically one conclusion, which is Intel has to divest its foundry business. Now we did say that there are scenarios that could preserve Pat's vision, one being China invades Taiwan and takes control of TSMC. But by our estimate, that's got to happen within a year because Intel will be out of, out of money within a couple of years. Out of money in the sense that it won't be able to raise new money uh, because of the trajectory it's on. So it has to do something. The other possibility is the U.S. military subsidizes Intel because it's so strategic, and this will buy Intel more time. But but that end game is, is inevitable. And so in our view, the only way that Gelsinger's vision could come true is if he had access to hundreds of billions of dollars in in cash, you know, and financing. And the last thing I would say is uh, folks might say, well, look, Dave, you're comparing, you and Floyer are comparing Intel to TSM. You don't have to do that because Intel's not going after TSM. They're really trying to overtake Samsung. But to that, we would say that Samsung has very similar challenges to Intel, maybe a little bit less because they have more volume because of their Android business. And they also have other sources of cash. You know, Samsung sells TVs and washing machines and is a big conglomerate, uh, but they face similar problems. So even if Intel catches Samsung, which would take a lot of money, um, they still face that quandary because TSMC sets the market price. So the only way Intel could compete in our view is that it could bomb the market keep, you know, get prices really low uh, and then buy the business, but it just doesn't have enough cash to do so. So we felt compelled, John, to put out sort of a, our counter argument only because we've done so much work in this area, you know, and at the risk of alienating, further alienating our relationship with Intel. Intel, as you know, is a customer of ours and has been for, you know, a decade plus. I have a 30-year relationship with Intel, but, but, but we felt like it was important to sort of tell the truth here, at least as we saw it. So, I mean, I, I had a burning feeling in my stomach when I read these posts that are a little bit off base. That's why I asked you a question, because when I read your special breaking analysis, you know, you bring up TSMC, obviously the leader, but you also um, highlight rights law. What is this right law thing? Because, you know, you said volume, volume, volume. Unpack that, because I think this becomes a critical piece of the equation. And how does that relate to Intel being kind of screwed at this point? So Theodore Wright was an engineer, and in the 1930s, mid-1930s, he posited that the, the cost of manufacturing anything, any widget, is a function of volume. And he said that as your cumulative volumes double, the cost of manufacturing the next generation of that widget um, declines by some constant percentage. And in semiconductors, it's, call it 15 to 20 percent, um, which is probably conservative when you factor in you know, Moore's law. And so because Wright's law is tied to volume, it says whoever is the volume leader is going to have the advantage. And Intel, as you well know, was the volume leader in the 90s with, and you and I have talked about this many times, is there's really two factors there. One is they have better costs. The second is they have better con time to market. So you remember well, 286, 386, 486, Pentium, Pentium II, et cetera. And they were always the leader. They would always be first to market and then AMD and everybody else would follow. And because they 
achieve that volume leadership because of Wright's law, because of the x86 and their massive volume because of PCs, they were able to overtake, and again, you remember this well, John, all the risk players. So HP, Sun, risk as in reduced instruction set computing, risk, Sun, the IBM power, they were all aspiring to have you know, servers in the mini computer and mid-range market. Intel came up market from the PCs and just wiped them out and has gained 90 plus percent share of that server market. So for years, they enjoyed a monopoly in PCs and in servers. That all ended when PC volumes peaked in 2012 and coincided with the ascendancy of the iPhone and other smartphones, which conferred that same advantage that Intel had uh, in the 90s, conferred that to the ARM ecosystem, those designers and those fabulous companies, uh, and TSM, and to a lesser extent, Samsung. Samsung, some, Samsung has some challenges right now, but TSM is obviously the dominant manufacturer for high-end chips. So what's your scenarios? How do you see the scenarios playing out for Intel? I, I really believe they have one choice, which is to divest its manufacturing business. Um, and then I think the chip, the design business will be fine if it can get that albatross of the, the manufacturing business off its neck. Now, Patrick's right. It's got negative value, but uh, it, it's this is so ironically reminiscent, John, and you'll remember this as well, uh, to IBM. So IBM actually, under Ginny Rometty, had to pay Global Foundries $1.5 billion to take over its uh, semiconductor manufacturing business. It was called the microelectronics business. Global Foundries took that $1.5 million, and they had a guarantee from IBM that IBM would spend $3 billion dollars in R&D and semiconductor research and give primary access to that research to global foundries. Well, guess what? Wright's law reared its ugly head and, and global foundries could not make that those advanced chips. I think it was seven nanometer and they had to tap out. IBM subsequently, I think is a, still in a lawsuit trying to get its money back. But when, when Wright's law flips, it's, it's like a savage we, we wrote. It will, you know, destroy you, and then you you will go into this death spiral. And the advantage of the the that the volume leader has, you know, continues. And so this is this is what we're seeing. And it's the reason why it's, again it's so ironic is you'll remember that my, uh, IBM basically handed its monopoly over to Intel when it chose to outsource the microprocessor to of, for the PC to Intel, and of course the operating system to to Microsoft. So that that IBM monopoly became Wintel. Intel dominated the hardware business for years, and the patterns are so eerily similar to what happened to IBM in the 90s. It's happening now to Intel in the 2020s. Yeah, I mean, to me, Intel has to divest their um, boundary business and focus on chip design. They got to capitalize on these emerging markets. They're booming. ARM and RISC-V are key areas. What's your take on that? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's fair to point out, okay, well, Dave, how do they do that? And we didn't go into the how. I think that requires a little bit more, more thinking, but, you know, possibly it's some kind of joint venture, um, you know, maybe with Samsung, but people have told me that, you know, that's not the right path. Uh, but I think potentially there's a way that there could be a, a, an industry consortium. But to your point, Intel, in our view, has to ride out it's x86 business. It's got to outsource that to CSM. Oh, by the way, it already does. It's advanced manufacturing of x86 is done by TSM. So that's fine. Do that. Outsource that. Become fabulous. And then you also well understand, John, how Intel would grab value through you know throughout the value chain of the system on a chip and the whole system to semiconductor you know value chain with x86. It, it gobbled up more value for PCs you know, with things like networking and, you know, et cetera, uh, and IO, and it's done that in servers. It's got to, in our view, replicate that using an ARM-based design uh, for its mainstream, you know, businesses, and also risk five for the Internet of Things, and, and basically say bye-bye monopoly, and then compete on the basis of, you know, innovative design, which, by the way, Intel is actually quite good at, and I think it's the design business is 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 in better shape than than Patrick Moorhead implied in his post. He sort of implied that the design business and the foundry business are hurting. I would argue that the design business is hurting because it's underfunded because 
the foundry business is sucking up all the cash and that that it, it, that's got to change financial instability is a big problem you know last last week after our podcast i posted a essay on linkedin and substack on my narrative around the aipc and you talk about volume there's another volume wave coming if you look at apple they just had their event this week new iphones watches airpods um which has some cool features by the way we can get into that but yeah apple's apple tsm our volume plays, right? So you can see the future devices are going to be integrated. The user experience is going to be connected. You can have consumer and enterprise scale, personalization. The personal computer is the watch. The personal computer is the device. The personal computer is the machine connected to a server. And we talked a little bit on the last pod, but Apple's got these new devices. They're the poster child for volume. Intel missed that wave. TSM caught that wave. And then you got companies like OpenAI. That's a freight train that keeps going down the track. It's it reportedly raised close to $7 billion at $150 billion valuation. Pretty crazy. Now, a lot of that came from the UAE Investment Fund. Um, the Strawberry AI reasoning models are out. Yeah, OpenAI is there. Glean, a company I featured on the Cube with uh, Google Cloud, raised right. $260 million at a $4.6 billion valuation. Oracle cut a deal with AWS. Well, well, the market's crazy. Oracle, AWS, hell froze over. They're now partners. Um, OpenAI, massive funding, six to seven billion dollars of cash at a hundred and fifty billion dollar valuation, and they're not even public yet. So, you get all that going on. Clearly, points to the open source model. Glean is an enterprise search company. Now they're an AI company because they're perfectly positioned with data. You got the um, Mistral out there and the cloud guys are going to be the big winners of this. So Oracle and AWS are together. You were at the event, Oracle Cloud World. I, I did not attend. Um, Oracle, multi-cloud, super cloud play, Dave. What is the Oracle, what is the Oracle Cloud? By the way, Dreamforce is next week. That's Salesforce event. They're already calling their product agent force. So our agentic system research going mainstream again, as we talked about last week. Falcon and MY's obviously the events will be it will be all the three event those events with the cube. So Dreamforce, Crowd, CrowdStrike, Falk, Falcon, and Mandy and MY's. But Dave, you got the um, the new Apple stuff, the AI PC on the horizon, open AI raising seven billion in cash, clean, these kinds of apps are getting tons of funding. The hyperscalers booming. Matt Garman on stage at Oracle Cloud World with Larry Ellison. I mean, that was a historic moment. Remember, Oracle customers have been running on AWS. Oracle's had a love-hate relationship with Oracle, as they did with Microsoft. But a lot of the customers run their stuff on AWS. So give us the take. What is the analysis for the Oracle Cloud World and the AWS deal in particular? So I'll pull out my, my dead tree. The Wall Street Journal had an article. Um, <laughs> This week, uh, and it said it was written by uh, Tom Doughton. It says Oracle thrives as cloud provider in AI era, and it said Oracle missed the tech industry's move to cloud computing last decade and ended up in also ran. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Yes, it kind of was late to cloud, but it's not an also ran. I I'm very impressed with what Oracle has done with its cloud. It's got a highly differentiated strategy, and I would say, of all the players. Cloud players and on-prem players. Oracle has the best multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, super cloud strategy. I mean, IBM's got a strong hybrid cloud as well, uh, but but Oracle is now inserting, embedding OCI, Oracle Compute Infrastructure, inside of Azure, inside of Google, inside of AWS. And of course, that was the big news. Matt Garman was on stage. You're absolutely right. Tons of Oracle customers already run on AWS, and there was a lot of friction between Oracle and AWS. They finally buried the hatchet. Larry Ellison, the first keynote I've ever seen where he didn't crap on the competition, didn't even mention a competition in a negative light. You know, we're faster, we're better from EMC, Workday, SAP. Over the years, you've seen it as well. Exactly. It was just all lovey-dovey. And Matt Garman came up on stage. They didn't hug, they shook. Uh, and then they brought out a joint customer, which is obviously, you know, what AWS loves to do, working backwards from the customer. They always talk about customers, same with Oracle. Tons of customers at this show, 25,000 people, a lot of suits. 
They had the CTO of State Street come out. So that was the big news. But I will tell you, in, in regards to Oracle, they they have some holes in their in their stack, if you will. But they are kicking ass. OCI is highly differentiated. It's got a it's got you know it's super fast. It's got high high speed RDMA networks. Uh, it's got certainly credible compute storage. Uh, it's got GPU access. And then you put the database on top of that with autonomous database. You know, they make the claim that we're the only autonomous database out there. 23 AI, you know, cute naming, um, uh, is their new database. And then on top of that, they've got, you know, analytics, which is built into the database. Uh, and then, then they've got an awesome application suite with Oracle Fusion. And then they have industry apps. They bought Cerner. And they've got a, a, a really interesting opportunity here in Agentic, something you talked about earlier. So while AWS, while the AWS announcement was the big news, a little sort of, I, I think one of the pieces of technology that's, that's that was overlooked, which to me is even more interesting, is they now have the ability, John, within a single database to harmonize data, SQL data, JSON data and graph data. So when we talk about this harmonization layer and being able to surface that to agents so that agents can operate, multiple agents together can operate and to, to uh, solve for workflows, Oracle said, you know, showed about 51 agents that it's is, is developing. It promised it would have them out by next year. They are all in on this stack. And granted, it's it's confined to the Oracle Red Stack. They announced SA, uh, Salesforce integration, but Salesforce runs on Oracle. But nonetheless, it is one of the most advanced kits, if you will, that I've seen in the marketplace. The, the knock on it is it's you know large, it's very Oracle Red Stack heavy, but man, they're kicking butt. And if you look at their financials, they have a $99 billion remaining performance obligations. And they in their analyst meeting, the financial analyst meeting on uh, Thursday, they upped their 26 and longer term midterm forecast from 9% revenue growth to 16%. And the stock is up again on that. So they're, I don't know what the valuation is today. Last time I looked, they were about a $440 billion valuation. Um, I'll check as to what they are today, but they are, you know, moving on all cylinders. You know, the one gap I would say is, you know, in that data lake space. That analytics space, I think they're a little bit behind, but they're they're good at at filling gaps. The last thing I'll say is classic or Oracle, classic Larry. He stood up and said he announced the beginning of the multi cloud era, like he invented it. It was beautiful. It well, was you know, awesome. Larry's not a dumbass. We know that, and I think I think you know he's realizing the rising tide floats Oracle too. So multi cloud, highly differentiated, as you point out. Um, they've had engineered systems. They co coined that term before anybody else. So Oracle definitely saw the vision and they have the database. And we know as we cover the data business, open table formats, data interoperability, Oracle will be a piece of the puzzle. They won't be the one database that ruled the world. So I think this is a reflection that Larry Ellison is realizing that I can make more money with OCI and engineered systems. And if you look at what one of the smartest CEOs like Hawk Tan and VMware are doing, Apple's doing. Vertically integrated engineered systems is what is happening. And all the data people need to build those ecosystems where the engineers can code as fast to the hardware and system as possible. So Oracle database is becoming system software for data. And I think they realize that they have to work across environments, multi-cloud, we call it super cloud. And I think that's a really key acknowledgement in Larry Ellison essentially tipping his hand by being so nice that one, financially, he's going to do well because he knows financially that's a good move for him. And two, the architecture of distributed computing favors Oracle's differentiated strategy. So no doubt in my mind that that is definitely a tell sign to me that the world that we've been reporting on is rolling out the way it is. And I think that's a big plus. And waiting on the sidelines right now is the starving, hungry for innovation developers. And I think as the bubble either pops or the air comes out here on the valuations, either way, it's a Cambrian explosion of applications. And so 
if I'm Oracle, I want that market. If I'm Amazon, I want that market. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, again, Oracle doesn't lose everything, but they probably will gain share and not lose share. Amazon will probably gain share, as will all the other database players. So, you know, it's 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 a multi-database world. I think we coined that term uh, almost a decade ago, but it's happening. And you're seeing Gen AI as a pressure point for this innovation cycle because, you know, the open AI valuation points to the fact that personal productivity is increasing, hence the AI PC or AI devices will be systematically re-architected. And that was the premise of my essay. And I think this all points to the clouds being the power source. I mean, at some point, the GPU short will kick in. I mean, even though even though Core Wave just did a secondary, sold some internal shares, their valuations up from 19 billion to 26 billion. So Core Weave and companies like that are going to continue to do well. The question is, they got to pay down their their um, their business debt, if you will, of raising all that cash. So you know, there's going to be a crisis in the GPU market when all those people who hoarded the machines are going to need to put them to use. So. You know, I think Oracle sits there as an alternative, as does, say, Tesla, as X, as Amazon, as Meta. These GPU owners are going to do it. Now, I'll pick this up because another thing that got my attention, I didn't write about it yet, but Code Conference was announced um, yesterday that they're canceling it. That's the famous Kara Swisher Walt Musburger conference. That was the industry event. They postponed it for two years in a row. Well, this week, the All In podcast had an event, All In Summit. Jason Kalkanis, Chamath, um, Freeberg, and Sachs all had their event, as well as the acquired podcast where Zuckerberg was there. They packed in Chase Stadium. There's a new level of events coming, Dave, and they're replacing the Code Conference, number one. Yeah. Number two, uh, at the All In podcast, they had a lot of great names. I mean, that's the future conference. That's the way conference should be run, open, um, democratized. It was still expensive. They still made a lot of money. So congratulations to Jason and the team over there. They, they're, they're probably doing great. Um, but Sergey Brin flew in, and he was asked um, about the Gen AI stuff. He said, I'm super excited. I show up every day to work. I don't want to miss out. <laughs> Here you got Sergey Brin saying, I don't want to miss out. He's alpha as they come uh, in terms of technologists. And he, he said when he was a PhD student, he couldn't do the kind of things they're doing now. And, and so I think, again, that's another tell point. In that same interview with Sergey Brin, totally unscripted because he doesn't have a PR handler. He said, quote, Google Cloud, Google Cloud, referring to their engine, is turning customers away because they don't have enough compute. Now, the press missed that comment. I don't think anyone reported on it, but what Sergey is basically saying is there's just not enough compute to go around. And so he said, quote, we're turning customers away, meaning Google Cloud. So, okay, take, take that in, into consideration for a second. What does that mean? That means that Google, who's fighting for market share, doesn't have enough horsepower to potentially do that. If he says that in that context, that means that validates our thesis that no matter what they're doing, CapEx gain will continue to move forward. I think it's going to be a race arms race, but epic proportion. You're going to see massive clouds race as fast as they can to build compute services and compute, I say XPU, every single processing unit you can figure out. GPUs, obviously, today, but you can't put a GPU in a street light for an IoT device. So I think the distributed computing paradigm that Larry Ellison pointed out, combined with this the tsunami of apps and the starving developers waiting to get their, their hands on some real compute, is going to thrive in this market. So we're going to see how that plays out. That might save the core weaves of the world if they get the right offering. So interesting data point, Dave. Yeah. You know, the think, conference game is changing. Hats off to the, to the new conference guys. And the fact that compute is huge. I mean, Kara, you're right. used to get all the best guests, Steve Jobs and Larry and so forth, but now it's the all-in guys. They they do get kick-ass guests. It was interesting that Sergey interview you talked about. He said that when he was in 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 graduate school, or maybe even undergraduate, it was like, yeah, artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural nets. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Here's a you know quick primer on it, but it's going nowhere. Yeah, don't worry about it. And it then things was low on the profile right. on, the, on the on the courseware. Yeah. And to your point a few about, algorithms. What does it do? I don't know what it does. 
Is it useful? I don't being, know if it's useful. <laughs> right. And to your point about being capacity constrained, that's really was an interesting comment. And then you got Oracle. I think Oracle is legit number four cloud now behind uh, Alibaba um, or, or number five, really, behind Alibaba. I think it's going to become a legit number four and surpass Alibaba. And people really don't pay attention to Alibaba, but it's got a substantial business in China. I think Oracle is going to you know, pass surpass $10 billion this year in IaaS. And then you throw in their SaaS, it's probably going to be about $25 billion. So now that's bigger than than Alibaba. So I guess they're, I would say they're already there. So I think they're a legitimate number four cloud, way still behind um, uh, Amazon. They're maybe 10% of Amazon's IaaS business, but I'm going to start tracking in my quarterly uh, Oracle and maybe some other companies. But that's that's was um, something that I think is is worth noting. And again, to the point about the Wall Street or, or Journal article, I mean, they are now a legitimate cloud provider and they have AI chops. They have a boatload of GPUs. And they're in, I, I loved what Larry said on the earnings call. He didn't really talk much about this at, uh, on his keynote. Um, he talked really about two things, multi-cloud and security, and how AI is it, autonomous is going to solve the security problem. But what he said on the earnings call is, you know, I don't get it. These people talk about, you know, AI like it's a separate thing. When are you going to monetize it? And he was asked that question from one of the analysts. He's like, we're monetizing it every day with Cerner. And he went through all the examples of applications, meaning the point is his whole strategy is to embed AI into the applications. And he took a swipe at Microsoft without mentioning them. He said, I don't get it. These people are selling AI separately. He's talking about co-pilots when Microsoft's charging, you know, $35 per month per user. And he's like, we're not going to do that. We're going to embed it everywhere. And that's how we're going to create value. So I thought that was sort of an interesting juxtaposition to what you see in the marketplace. People are like, oh, you're spending all this money in AI. When are we going to you know, see a return? Well, Larry's saying we're seeing already, uh, and it's just going to be embedded. I've always agreed with that. I've always been surprised at how a lot of buyers are thinking, well, we're going to do kind of our own AI or we'll just go directly to the LLM vendors. I think by far, most of the AI is going to be consumed embedded inside applications. You talked about Salesforce and the announcement they just made. And the advantage that Oracle has, and we can get off of that, is they've got all the business logic inside all those applications are locked inside, but they have access to that. They've, they've spent the, the R&D money to get Fusion integrated, and now they have this duality that 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 SQL, JSON, and graph harmonization that they can now serve up, up to, to those agents, tapping that business logic. They'll figure out analytics and the whole data lake. They got to do better there, but eventually they will, all embedded in the database. And they got they still have the best database. And he's Larry's kind of right. Nobody really has, except for Oracle, a fully autonomous database. So yeah, they're sitting pretty right now, which is why they raised their forecast. It's you got to. Look, we've talked about this a lot, John. You can crap on Oracle all you want, but they execute. They eventually get it right. That's why I say VMware under Broadcom is taking kind of the Oracle playbook, mesh it with Apple, and that's what they're going to look like. Uh, Oracle is interesting, too, on the CapEx side. Um, you know, the CapEx um, tracker yeah. is really Charles Fitzgerald. Fitzy tracks this. He calls them a clown car. Um, you know, CapEx clowns, he calls them. He, he calls Oracle clowns because he says they all they talk about is that they're building data centers but they're actually just putting racks in the hyperscalers, which is phase one. I mean, that's what Oracle is basically doing with AWS. And the challenge for Oracle and everybody right now is how much CapEx do you do? How does that look like? And SiliconANGLE was covering the um, AI Hardware and Edge Summit, our AI Hardware and Edge AI Summit in San Jose this week. The number one conversation there, according to Mark Albertson, our, our lead on this, is the challenge confronting the companies is, is with is the task that they all have, which is building out the support for generative AI. Okay, speed and complexity are two big problems and uh, roadblocks along the way. So if you are living in the old distributed computing paradigm of data center or cloud or on-premise, and you're not re-architecting that for clustered, as I would call client-like, ser client-server-like capability, you might not have the right architecture. So I think from the AI PC, from the device into the cloud, across all those environments, the architecture of the hardware has to be rethought through. I think that's why I'm a huge fan of the um, NVIDIA and the 
um, Dell messaging around AI factories. So the AI PC absolutely has to be an extension of the AI factory. I call it client server in quotes, not in the classic client server, but you know that paradigm is coming back, Dave. Client server implied be connected to a server does the heavy lifting and the client gets offloaded. So uh, to the server. So here, here you have this kind of notion of the apps need to tap the data anywhere. So yep. Oracle, anyone in the data warehouse business that's going to uh, multi-environment, whether it's the, the the old school and growing yellow bricks of the world to um, any company that's been doing, you know, say SQL stuff or semi-structured, they're going to have to deal with multi-formatted data, right? And this is going to be a big thing. So you're a database player right now. You are loving life because a lot of these database companies, whether they're legacy and or transitioning from the Hadoop era to the modern era, they have huge retention, okay? Because they ain't going anywhere. I mean, they have the goods, they have the data. There is no AI without data. So I think um, this interplay between the infrastructure innovation, okay, and the data integration, powering agentic applications or applications that have embedded agents in them and large scale scalable apps, we talked about last week, the new category, you know, it's the integrations. So I think you're gonna see a lot of action in the ecosystem between integrations. The technical the technical innovation would be around the integrations. This is where well, I think the multi-cloud thing is a right strategy. We've always said it was super cloud. And Kong this week announced generative AI to be an abstraction layer on top of APIs. So, so APIs are being abstracted away by uh, essentially agentic capability. So what this means is all the plumbing is gonna be invisible. Yeah, so agents absolutely. and applications will ride on top. That's the premise for this Cambrian explosion I've been saying for years. Now we have it in clear sight that at the top of the stack, there's two categories, agentic systems embedded in with applications. That's a developer concept with data and then large scalable apps that take over for the SaaS apps, solving problems you couldn't solve only with specialized HP high performance computing gear or problems that were unsolvable because of the time it takes to either analyze it. That's why you see use cases in healthcare, use cases in, in chemistry and biology, because you've got the horsepower now to run everything. So, so um, big time uh, change. On, on your comments on, on multi-cloud, super cloud, I mean, again, the, the reason why Oracle, I think, has a truly differentiated strategy is they were the first, and I would say they are still the only to have identical uh, clouds everywhere. The only difference in Oracle's clouds is the size of the cloud, the number of racks. And you can say, oh, it's just brute force and it's the Oracle red stack. And, and that's all true, but that's what you want. You want same, same. And Oracle was the first to do that. Now, the other company that I think is really in this mix is IBM. IBM doesn't have the infrastructure. It certainly doesn't have the cloud. It, it, it blew cloud under Ginny. Uh, but Arvin's acquisition of Red Hat is right on because that kept them in the game, it got them back in that hybrid sort of multi-cloud game with a software defined strategy, thanks to Red Hat and OpenShift. And they've, they've got, you know, excellent AI, you know, Watson 2.0 is very strong. We're gonna hear more about that in uh, next month down in New York City. I'm excited, John, to, 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 that you're going to that. I was super impressed last year at the Thomas Watson uh, Research Facility and uh, IBM does a really good job. They're gonna roll out you know, their thought leaders, but they're going to, their strategy is really to put Watson X everywhere to really open up at the, the partnership and the ecosystem. They're doing it across clouds. They're doing it on-prem and, you know, Red Hat OpenShift is, you know, trying to be that standard. And it truly is the gold standard, you know, of, you know, that class of, of product, whether you want a containers, call it containers or container plus, or, you know, it's got more than obviously containers, but, and, and you know that well, but I think that, um, Look, IBM stock is at an all-time high, and a big part of that is that Arvin's got them really focused on uh, on on executing, and the markets that where they can dominate. Or so, at least Sarjicho All, a Cube Collective member, just commented on your post uh, with his own narrative around this. It's a really good analysis. Um, he agrees. I like how Sarjit it. does that, John. He's like, he doesn't just chime in with a golf clap. He really thinks it through. So, no, I mean, this is. The <laughs> This is this is the model, Dave. This is this is the call. What influencers do? They it's like open source. They build on top of original content. So, your post was a good, good original piece. As always, real time content, real time insights. I mean, to me, 
what you're doing with breaking analysis, high frequency insights. It's, it's really, and the fact is, is that it puts the other analysts to shame um, because it's so accurate and so real time that, you know, the posts that are written that take a lot of time, um, we're pumping it out in real time. So, you know, don't stop that. I mean, a lot of people love those posts. So keep that rolling. Um, you know, this whole open AI funding, okay, is I want to come back to the open AI and get a preview for what we're going to be talking about next week. Okay. So to me, the tell sign is open AI and others are creating a very frothy application market. So you're seeing the word chatbot evolve to agents. Even Mark Benioff, who would never miss a good trend, will jump on anything and invent it like Larry. You know, he's a he's a uh, student under Larry Ellison. Uh, he calls it agent force. Dream force is the name of the conference. Sales force, agent force is now the new thing. Don't uh, you love this name? <laughs> I love it. Agent force. It sounds really kind of like CIA like, you know, very cool. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan. As I, I ranted last week, agents, agents are the killer app. I think developers will deal with data just like they did with security. It'll be built in from day one and they'll be programmatic because Gen AI is a runtime assembly construct and that's going to change the nature of applications. So SaaS apps are going to evolve to agentic apps with developers and net new scalable apps is the new SaaS. That's the that's what's happening at the top of it. Very you, clear to me that's happening. Can you explain that runtime to folks? Because you know people talk about microservices, but microservices are hard coded, and agents are going to be sort of these these self forming uh, agents are going to observe things that can't be hard coded or were too complicated to put into microservices. And and so to explain what you you're talking about when you talk about you know at runtime. Yeah. So one of the big biggest waves that's hit us is cloud, right? Cloud and web services, Amazon web service. The name came from state-of-the-art um, technology at the time. Web services was a series of technologies that basically decomposed elements and then collected them together while applications were running, mostly web apps, and then uh, mobile and SaaS in that order, right? So when you have building blocks, you assemble them at runtime, a query and applications loading a function call, a database, um, as Jensen calls it, programmatic access, whereas pre-programmed and then it assembles. Okay, it's, it's a concept in computer science oversimplified for the for this illustration. Um, very critical architecture, and then the function or the output is assembled at runtime and since uh, something happens in the application. Mm -hmm. What Jensen Wong talked about at NVIDIA, where he, where he clearly talked about this new category of generative AI, like we all work with open AI and these tools, when you type a prompt in, it generates a response and sometimes it gets a different answer. Why? Because it's generating the answer on the fly. What that means is it's generating the answer. This hasn't been queried before. Now you start to see things like caching, prompt, and um, prompts that are getting intelligent. So you're starting to see more progress there. But at the end of the day, the generative AI new category is generating results. So that means you have to decompose the data elements and all the systems underneath if you're a developer. So when a user prompts or an application uh, generates something with Gen AI, which is personal productivity and more scalable, you got to assemble things and then glue them together at, at real time, at you know on the fly, basically. That's generative. That's what they call runtime. It's running, and you put it together at the point of execution. So, um, and that is that is a fundamental shift that's accelerating so fast. And applications need to be smart. And if you don't have things addressed and and um, named and um, identifiable, you can't run them. You can't assemble so, them. It's like it's like yeah. knowing what you have in your kitchen. You pull so it together and you make a meal. So, so take to me, that's the key success point right now. And not everything data wasn't built that way. So, so take that runtime concept and imagine how organizations work today. There's a workflow and that workflow is essentially hard coded, like microservices are hard coded. And so when somebody new comes into an organization or existing folks, they have to sort of adhere to that workflow or the things break, Yeah. right? It causes disruption. You see it all the time in an organization with agentic, all those sort of dark, all that dark matter in <laughs> organizations and workflows can be assembled, as John's saying, in runtime. And so 
what agents will do is they are going to observe what humans do, how they respond, how they react, how they call audibles, and they will reassemble workflows and create them in run, in real time yeah. at runtime. And that is a completely radical change to how we do business and can drive, you know, Larry was even talking about this. David Floyer has talked to us about this a lot is that's a 10 X productivity gain for organizations over time. It's, yeah, it's, it allows it's you to do things, Dave, that you can't do before in the past. I mean, run runtime is a is an operating system concept. It's grounded yeah. in decades of computer science. Uh, anyone who's written system software knows you assemble link things and you kind of pull them together uh, and and make them one when when you need it. When you think about cloud native and what's been going on in the Kubernetes world, that whole microservices wave has all been about making the infrastructure. Um, flexible and elastic enough so that it can scale. So what's going on right now is under the covers, but below the application, you have the data layer, and then you have the infrastructure layer, which is a combination of hardware and GPUs, and then a series of other things in a control environment where you can need to stand stuff up, make connections, access databases, run software, observe the data, all these things that have been building over the past decade in the CNCF and the Linux Foundation are moving fast. We call that platform engineering. The big trend with the data wave coming, Gen of AI, is that data engineering is merging with platform engineering. And that is uh, the same kind of principles. It's not data science. It's not data uh, querying. It's managing data at scale with software. And if you look at NVIDIA's CUDA and how successful they are, everyone's going down that road of building software around the infrastructure so that you can set up a service, tear it down, stand it back up based upon the generative in, generative aspect of it. So when an application is functioning under the covers in that dark matter, stuff's happening on behalf of the application. And that's why the, the agentic will be successful uh, if you do that right architecturally and you roll out that system architecture, it'll work. The scalable apps work because you've got pure supercomputing that's been democratized for the masses. That means a data scientist can work on, say, some biology um, experiment or algorithm or anything that would have taken them the alternative path y years ago would have been, I got to sign up for some high performance computing, spend a lot of money on gear, and then hope in a few hours the data sets well, be, would be computed upon. That's now done in minutes, okay? So you're talking about companies like Boeing doing wing design. I mean, the calculations involved in simulating wing design is huge. And that's why the Cube Research's article in The Economist on digital twins is so important because that article that points to the future of how things will be engineered. You simulate them, you tear down processes, you look for improvements. This is now being done at such high rates. It's going to accelerate uh, improvement and then start bringing in an era of personal productivity because the system will work on behalf of the user and it'll run at enterprise scale. So large scale systems for companies, for applications, as well as the end user, the consumer will get that benefit. So an iPhone has some processing on it. It gets smaller, faster, cheaper. And that's going to connect into an agentic server AI factory and run. And that's the relationship that's happening at large scale. And it's distributed from centralized cloud services to on-premises AI factories with proprietary data to edge devices like your phone or a lamppost for computer vision. All that stuff's going to pool into massive supercomputing systems. This is a big deal. And in my opinion, it's going to change the nature of the applications. And that's why if you look at the open source models right now, literally the leaderboard's like a revolving door. It's Samba Nova one day, it's OpenAI the next, it's uh, Cerebrus. I mean, every day it's like, it's like the NASCAR race. Everyone's kind of bundled up, someone's in the lead, they draft behind the other one and then they move. So to me, that is what's going on. And this is why Sergey Brin basically stepped out of retirement, so to speak, and goes into the office every day because one, it's intoxicating technically because it's a lot of hard problems and great advancements. And two, if you're if you're a nerd, you don't want to miss out on it. It's like it's the coolest thing that's happened in the computer industry since the personal computer hit the scene. 
It really yep. is that impactful. So, you know, if you're watching this and you look at the stocks, you're going to have to bet on the ones that are going to be driving that. That's the power pro providers, electrical power, data centers, the cloud providers that has all the horsepower. And then this data layer is going to be the next area that was just going to explode in value. And that's why Oracle's shifting gears and singing a different song because Larry Ellison gets it. He's like, I'm going to go win the multi-cloud game. Why? Because my database is everywhere. I don't need to be competing against Amazon. I'll just ride their wave because the tide's rising. Every, all the boats will float. And their boat is pretty damn big. Sorry. And for Amazon's part, they're like, yeah, come on in. We'll sell more of our stuff around your database. Great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Larry's customers. probably like, okay, Amazon's going to get rich, but so am I. Who cares? Right. <laughs> yeah. exactly. and, you know, just a point on your scenario on Agentic. I think you're absolutely right on it. It's going to completely change the entire application stack. Um, and and I'm really excited to see how that uh, shakes out. There are missing pieces. Again, that was I was really uh, intrigued seeing that what they call duality, that ability to harmonize graph, JSON, and SQL data. Something like that is going to have to be uh, created, and people are working on it, firms like Relational AI and, and others, and for companies like Salonis are working on it, uh, Salesforce, uh, uh, I think UiPath is, is, is going to be in that mix, uh, ServiceNow is definitely going to be in that mix, and then this agent systems is wide open, there's tons of money pouring into that, yeah, and I it's mean, going to completely change. Green financing points to the fact that every vertical is yep. going to be gen ai disrupted in an enabling way and i think that's going to bring in new brands ipos are going to come back quick the bubble that we're in right now will probably won't pop but i think a slow fast um air coming out of that balloon so to speak it won't pop i think it'll the air will come out because the hyperscalers are involved and you take that factor in you'll see new brands emerge that'll be part of a new ecosystem a new ecosystem's upon us and just like SaaS created those ecosystems in the cloud, you're going to see a whole nother level of ecosystems. You'll see Salesforce, you'll see AWS, you'll see Oracle, you'll see the chip manufacturers. We talked about this at length last time about the ISV category developing with with uh, with chip manufacturers. Why? Because they got software. Because NVIDIA, uh, almost a decade ago, inv started investing in software, and they continue to do that. So, you know, the formula is starting to appear, and just like the internet bubble it did pop but everything that was overvalued ended up happening right so if you look at the dot-com bubble the internet dot-com bubble oh yeah pet pet food food delivery pet stores online well guess what it ended up happening so i think the same exact thing is going to happen here but it's not going to be a massive pop it's going to be a more of a venture pop evaluation pop and then some companies will die from being overfunded and then ones will rise up that are doing the work and will be successful. And again, it, it is a land grab, but you have to show the value and it's going to be a value-based market. If there's no proof in the pudding, you're not going to win. So I, I think there's categories up for grabs, every single one, media, oil and gas, financial, all you need go down the vertical list. A new brand will come up and we'll see, and, and they'll be category winners. They won't be just like nibbling for some food. They will take down the category. And I think the incumbents, if they don't shift, they will probably die. And that's why, you know, we, we always riff about Dell. Every time they shift in these waves, they've been on the other side, they've been on the right side of history. Dell, Dell was not a web company. They were a mail order, order over the phone, in comes the web, it's direct ordering, direct Rushed. response. Yeah. Hey, it's a direct response vehicle, no problem. We'll use the web to sell direct because yep. they were doing it before. So I think you're going to see companies like Dell say, wow, Agentic Systems are direct consumer productivity gains, I can not only sell direct, but I can build my devices to be direct to the consumer. And that's a, that's the personal computer. It's personal, but it's not one thing. It's like everything. And yeah, Apple's got it right. You got a MacBook, you got an iPhone, I got a watch, I'll have a device on me. There'll be devices in the car. That's the new personal system. And, and I, I think it's a lot like the internet and in that every company is going to take advantage of it um, as opposed to, you know, the cloud was like, highly disruptive. I think everybody's leaning into AI. It's going to be deeply embedded into all layers of the stack and into industry applications. 
we're just gonna it's just gonna be ubiquitous. I think Larry's you know commentary on that is is right on, and and I think it, it actually is gonna be one of these rising tides. I know that's kind of a, a bromide, but um, but I I believe it. So uh, I wish you know the only thing is to, to how to figure out how Intel can take advantage of so it. So Dave, next week we got Dreamforce with a cube. Yeah. We got CrowdStrike Falk Falcon. Falcon. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we got Google Mandiant. Yep. M wise, threat detection, threat hunting, um, part of Google security. Yep. Um, big time events and the event windows kicking in. What's your take? What's the preview on CrowdStrike? You'll be at CrowdStrike. I'll be at Mandiant. Uh, Christoph uh, Bertrand will be at uh, with Rob Streche at Dreamforce with the team. George Gilbert will be there too. George Gilbert will be there. We got full team coverage. We're out and we're out and about all week next week. Yep. Three good shows. Obviously, we talked about Dreamforce and Salesforce. Huge AI opportunity there. And again, and there we're doing the, uh, it's going to be we're doing some programming with the uh, with the NYSE at uh, Salesforce, aren't we? Yeah, we're with the NYSC San Francisco Trading Office on Kearney, which is one block from St. Regis, right on the corner from Moscone. Our web is set there, a little studio. Thanks to the NYSE. Brian Bauman, thank you very much, and team. Uh, great collaboration with those guys, as, as we're now an independent operator on the floor in New York. So, you know, so we'll, we'll rock and roll. So CrowdStrike, I'm excited for CrowdStrike. Obviously, um, coming off of the July 19th incident, if if I were CrowdStrike, I would not dwell on that, and I don't think they will. I think they've done their apologies, they've done their tour, and, and done the mea culpa. I think I think now the message should be, and I believe will be, resilience. So how can CrowdStrike and its and its innovations uh, support better business resilience? Um, and they have a flex pricing model that I think will be front and center, um, maybe not so much at the show, we'll see, but certainly in customer conversations where they will allow customers to mix and match. And and so rather than having sort of bespoke pricing and okay, well, you bought that and you're, you're locked into that, they'll let you uh, uh, flexibly move in and out of different services. So I, I think that combined with their AI innovations uh, in XDR and cloud security and in the way in which they treat endpoints around identity. Uh, they've got a lot of innovations there. They'll ha they're having a, a strong ecosystem. It's growing. I think that we're at the ARIA. I think they're going to be outgrowing the ARIA soon. Um, and you know, you're going to, you're going to see companies in the ecosystem like Zscaler, uh, like Okta, uh, the GSIs like Deloitte are going to be there in force. And um, and I'm excited uh, to to sit down with George Kurtz and and focus on the future. You know, I don't think he's going to dwell on the past. I think he's going to move forward as 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 he as he always does. He's he's fast moving and kind of a baller. So I'm excited to see him again. So just to kind of wrap up, we have to end on a regulatory note because um, there's been a, uh, a lot of stuff going on on the internet. The EU, the Prime Minister of Italy, gave a talk. And um, he was pretty aggressive. He was saying that the EU's industrial structure lacks dynamicism with a few new companies rising to drive growth. No, notable, notably, no U EU company found in the last 50 years has market value over uh, 100 billion euro, while the U.S. has created six companies over a trillion euro in the same period. So they're seeing the productivity growth slowing down in Europe. They're trying to close the innovation gap between the U.S. and China and Europe. Um, but this speaks directly to the regulatory battles, Dave, that's stifling innovation. We talk about this all the time, complex Byzantine rules. I mean, regulation, again, the balance, I always say balance innovation. This is a case, case that supports my uh, dogma about, you know, let chaos reign, then reign in the chaos. Over-regulation could hurt things. And, you know, you're starting to see, you know, academic excellence wither in Europe compared to the U.S. and China, just here we go. These barriers are stifling innovation in the tech sector in Europe. Your I thoughts? I think, um, you know, to your point earlier about the all-in pod taking over for Kara Swisher, I thought Bill Gurley's talk at last year's all-in summit was one of the most instructive conversations about the damage that regulatory capture uh, can cause. And if you haven't watched it, go back to all-in summit 23, Bill Gurley. It's quite good. Uh, he explained, you know, how when you have these leaders 
and the government comes in and you got these dominant companies and the government sets all these regulations, it really favors the sort of monopoly uh, or the oligopoly. And so that just kills, it stifles innovation. Um, he used an example in the telecoms industry. You remember when things were opening up, there was some VC money pouring into telecom. Well, the big whales just, they, they captured the, the regulatory uh, uh, environment and, and locked everyone out. And, and you're seeing that you know, in other industries, you're certainly seeing that in 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 you know communications today. Uh, you're seeing that in financial services in in many regards, as the big just keep getting bigger. So I think you're right. It, it is a balance. Uh, there needs to be regulation. I think you know Liz Warren is way over the top. You know, maybe Trump is a little little too loosey goosey. But but I think there there needs to be a balance. I, I'd like to I'd like to see personally. I'd like to see less government. Uh, I think. Uh, I think nobody, none of these candidates are talking about the debt, and uh, and that's a big concern. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, that- regulation definitely sets the table. You know, you know the old expression: the U.S. innovates, China replicates, and the U EU regulates. Yeah. And and right. that is a this is an example of innovation right now, given what we just talked about the changing landscape. The world has changed uh, in every every function of a company. Yeah. These digital twins are coming. Process improvement, classic business school 101 is coming to every single company. So I think we're going to see a resurgence of, you know, Peter Drucker books coming out, process improvement. Um, competitive strategies is going to be about process improvement, and you're going to see um, value extraction big time. I think it's going to see a wave. So I think the EU and the folks there, whether it's energy or uh, innovation in every sector, they got to stop regulating to the extent that they are. So, you know, uh, uh, will they over, are they over regulating? That continues to be the question. And where's the innovation? Where's the beef? Show me. Where's I think, the beef um, on the bone? I think too, John, your point about process you know, strikes a chord with me because I think, you know, how we talk about cloud native, I think you're going to see AI native companies, meaning their processes end to end are going to be all agentic. And they are going to be really disruptive to those companies that are sort of bolting on AI. So if you're starting your, your a company today, you know, with AI from the get-go, AI native data at the core, AI surrounding that data, and you're driving processes that are you know highly highly automated, you're going to be able to do way more with a lot less people, and and that's coming. Yeah, and we got to we got to clean up. You're going to see a trans ch changing of the guard, whether it's Intel to ARM to Nvidia. You're going to start to see that. You're going to see data layer change, and again, the tsunami of applications. Again, world changing moment in time right well, now. That's that's going to be a timeless this, moment. This Intel situation is really dire. I mean, Gina Raimondo, who is the you know Commerce Secretary, she's been all in on on Pat's vision. Which was, you know, right on. I we've talked on this pod before. Is hmm, you know, classic government. You saw what happened with Jedi. They said, all right, we're not going to just give it all to Amazon. We're going to dole it out in little pieces to everybody." And we know that that is not the ideal tech scenario. You know, heterogeneity equals complexity. And so, uh, you, you know, what's what's happened with the Chips Act is a, it's not enough money to bring back manufacturing to the U.S. It helps, but it's not enough. You know, I think two hundred billion dollars plus is kind of the the order of magnitude, and the government just can't afford that now. Uh, and I think that 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 splitting it up amongst a lot of players and seeing what happens, it's like when you go to the horse race. Okay, you want to pick the horse that's going to win. If you if you bet a little bit on on every horse, you're not going to get a big payout, and that's what's hard about horse racing is you got to pick the winner and the best gamblers what they do is they sniff out those those ones that are have a high probability of winning and are going to give a good return and if you spread the wealth too much uh you you can't get that type of return that you want and and i think that's what's happening with the chips act and you know intel gobbled up i think or was committed 10 billion but they've got to hit you know certain milestones so what happens to that where does that money go? Um, you know, is what's the right move now, and and what does it mean for the 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 situation from a military standpoint 
and a global competitive, competitiveness standpoint for the United States, these are really big decisions that the government has to make. And there's this big pile of money sitting out there. And there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And it's, and it's concerning. So I would like to see Intel's board make a decision and get some clarity so that you know the, the country can move forward in that regard. Well, Dave, great pod, great chat. Um, I wore my Bruins shirt today. I wore my um, Kraken shirt, Seattle Kraken, for uh, Andy Jassy and his team, because I know he's the owner of the Kraken. I'm going to try to get to see a game with him when I go up there um, to do my exclusive with Matt Garman prior to reInvent coming up uh, in a few months. But they got to wear the Bees shirt, Dave. Got to wear the Bruins shirt. I love it. Yeah, yeah the season's going to be starting soon. And, you know, optimism reigns in the fall, like just like spring for baseball. I gotta get shot, a shark shirt. For, <laughs> I gotta get a shark shirt for San Jose, and I gotta get an LA King shirt for LA. So, um, gotta gotta support the California teams. I love how you're a multimodal sports fan, John. Good yeah. job. Yeah, I jump on the band. Right? You know, I, I have being in the Boston roots, being out here for 25 years. You know, I've adopted the Niners because I saw them in the Super Bowl when I was 19. So I'm in '88. Um, but they're in the NFC. Patriots are in the AFC. Um, kind of a closet Giants fan, New York Giants growing up in New Jersey. Uh, so yeah. a little bit all over the map on football. Hockey, always been the Bruins. I like the Rangers, but I went to see Ranger games as a kid um, being East Coast, but uh, got to support the California teams. And I went to the first women's professional soccer game this past weekend with my daughter. Nice. The, uh, the, Bay, the, the Bay Area has a, a professional women's team. It's the inaugural season of women's soccer. Um, and it was, it was, it was awesome. So keep the sports going. And, right. Uh, yeah. Missed out on the uh, Amazon PGA thing. I saw ZS went to, so I, I didn't get the email. ZS went, um, I think. And uh, Andy Tarai uh, went. Tarai was there. I think Tim Crawford was there as well. They had, you know, it was a very select group of people. Yeah. I didn't get the invite either, but yeah, that's okay. I mean, that's We're playing uh, in the SAS Pro Am coming up. SAS companies. Yeah, that's going to be big. They turned down a big acquisition. They're growing with AI as well. We, they're going to. We're going to cover them again for the third straight year. Great team down there at SAS. Last year I played with Patrick Harrington. Let's see what I get with a draw this this time. But uh, that's going to be a fun event. SAS uh, uh, Championship. Tour. What was his nickname for you? The, the Beast of Technology. The beast of Tech. All right, you are a beast, John Furrier. Dave, we'll see you next time, and and. Uh, Thanks. I won't see you next week. We'll be at all the different events. Go to siliconangle.com. Check out all the covers we drop in there. Full team covers, thecube.net. Check out the videos. Go to thecuberesearch.com to get all this awesome, free, high-frequency insights from the Cube Research team. A lot of amazing insights, not just special breaking analysis and bringing it from Dave. Check that post out on LinkedIn for sure. Go to thecubeai.com. And, of course, you'll see a lot of videos coming out of our AI video cloud, third generation. So... We'll do our best to keep the content flowing and we'll see you next time.